It's such a pleasure to be here. I feel like everywhere I have been in the last week, from the streets of New York City, to the Amtrak terminal at Penn Station, to the cabin of my United Airlines flight out of Newark, I have encountered groups of wonderfully enthusiastic teachers letting me know they were excited that Christine and I would be speaking here today. I don't know the last time I have done a gig that has been so well publicized. <laughs> and it gave me a very happy feeling of teachers, they're everywhere. <laughs> like Christine, I hail from teachers. My grandmother and every one of her six sisters taught school in the Ozarks, where they were from. They taught school as a means of paying their own way through college. And my grandmother, who was the eldest, born in 1892, made sure that each one of them earned her degree. No small feat in that place and that time and being women to boot. I picture them as a merry troop of seven learned muses, bringing history, poetry, astronomy, and music to central Missouri, and getting themselves the education that would get them up and out. So in my family, we've always valued education in a very tangible way. I first met your esteemed AFT president, and now my good friend, Randy Weingarten, in 2001 the year my eldest child entered kindergarten. It was right around that time that Randy, in tandem with legendary ACORN leader John Kest, got together, got together and decided it was time for community leaders and teachers and parents like myself to join forces and fight for what they knew was in everybody's interest and most of all in the interests of children across New York State we needed to wage a major ground campaign to change the New York State funding formula and to require the state to adequately fund our schools. I'm sure she doesn't need more street cred than she already has, but I would like to take a moment to share a couple of my favorite stories about your fearless president. As we kicked off our community campaign to change the state funding formula and win increases in funding for our schools, the tragic events of 9-11 happened. And all of a sudden, we were looking instead at hundreds of millions of dollars of proposed cuts. Our resolve then turned even more steely. And over the course of that year, we hit the streets and halls of City Hall and Albany weekly and sometimes even daily. As the deadline for passage of the city budget loomed and the budget cuts were still on the table, we upped the ante and kicked off a week of daily protest rallies. Randy and I both got arrested, blocking the gates to City Hall in acts of civil disobedience. But if that wasn't enough, and it wasn't, since the mayor still refused to budge, Randy decided to push the envelope one step further, and the UFT, under her leadership, co-sponsored a massive 10,000-plus teacher and youth hip-hop rally together with Russell Simmons. It was advertised for weeks ahead of time on Hot 97, much like today's event. And if you Google hip-hop rally Randy Weingarten, you can see the priceless photos of such hip-hop luminaries as Alicia Keys, P. Diddy, LL Cool J, Jay-Z, and dozens more sharing the stage with Grandmaster Weingarten. <laughs> All united to demand the mayor stop the cuts to our schools. In a true victory for community teacher partnerships and for New York City's school children, that rally finally pushed the mayor over the edge and he agreed to spare our school's cuts and to favorably settle a pending teacher's contract. The power of parent, community, and teacher partnerships is concrete and real. And we need to join forces, harness that power, and put it to work across the country to take back our schools. There is a perception in America that public schools in our country are in crisis and decline. But in her latest book, Reign of Error, 
the hoax of the privatization movement, and the danger to America's public schools, Diane Ravitch puts her finger on a key point. In 1973, she tells us, 58% of Americans felt confident about public schools. But by 2012, that approval rating had dropped to only 29%. In striking contrast, however, Americans whose children attended public schools continued to have a very high opinion of their own schools. In yet another Gallup poll taken in 2012, only 19% of the public gave an A or a B to the nation's public schools. But 77% of parents awarded high marks to their own public school, the one they knew the best. The central theme of Diane's book is that the crisis in American education we hear about so often, and at such high decibels, is not really a crisis of academic achievement, but a concerted, aggressive effort to broadcast negativity about our public schools in an attempt to undermine their reputation, break the union, and eventually dismantle the public school system itself. The occasional bad teacher aside, and yes, we all know they exist. Students and parents on the whole love and respect their teachers, and they believe schools are doing a good job of educating their children. And where they aren't, the answer is not to fire the bottom 5 to 10 percent of teacher whose children, teachers whose children perform the most poorly on tests, but to turn to those basic truths we know about what does and doesn't work in our schools. It is time to take back our schools. The moment has arrived. I would be remiss today if I came to talk to 3,000 teachers about taking back our schools and neglected to talk to you about the man leading that charge in New York City with an aggressive, progressive education agenda, our new mayor, Bill de Blasio. Bill is a public school parent. In fact, he is, unbelievably, the very first mayor in New York City's recorded history to be both a sitting mayor and a public school parent at one and the same time. He campaigned on the promise of investing major resources and time into concrete programs we know work to improve our schools and student achievement. Most importantly, full-day pre-K for all, middle school after-school programs, and significantly increased numbers of community schools. Perhaps the most striking example of Mayor de Blasio's very different approach is the recently signed Teachers Union contract. It is incredible to think that when the former mayor's term ended, every single municipal union contract had lapsed some many years earlier. As soon as he took office, Mayor de Blasio set out to rectify that situation. And to date, he has successfully negotiated settlements with 60% of the city, city workforce in a way that benefits both the city and its workers. The contract, first out of the gates, that set the tone for everything to follow was the teacher's contract. After many years of angst and impasse, it was hammered out just a few months into the new administration and it incorporated groundbreaking measures focused on improving the education our children receive. As any parent who has been swept in and out of a parent-teacher conference knows, the extra time agreed upon for teachers to spend with parents will provide a critical tool for increasing parent engagement in the academic achievement of their child. The PROS program being introduced by two visionary partners, Chancellor Farina and UFT President Michael Mulgrew, is a cutting-edge approach to creating an environment of innovation in schools. By freeing schools of some DOE regulations and UFT work rules that have made innovation difficult, the PROS program offers schools the opportunity to experiment with creative ways to improve learning opportunities at the school level. We are putting our own stamp on education reform and defining it in a way that works for children, parents, teachers, and schools, 
across the system. With a progressive administration that respects and values the teaching profession and a strong collaborative partner at the UFT in Michael Mulgrew, the Chancellor, the Mayor, and the UFT accomplished in the first few months of the administration something corporate education reformers would have given their eye teeth to achieve any time during the last decade. So much more can be achieved with respect and a positive vision for education reform than with derision and finger pointing. Before I finish, I'd like to read an excerpt from a commencement address given at Smith College in 2008 by playwright Margaret Edson. Most people who know Margaret know her as the Pulitzer Prize winning author of the play Wit, but she is first and foremost a classroom teacher. She now teaches high school civics, but for most of her career she taught kindergarten. This is just an excerpt, but I encourage you all to YouTube it and watch her deliver the speech in full. She says, there are those who say classroom teaching is doomed. And by the time one of you addresses the class of 2033, there will be a museum of classroom teaching. Ever since the invention of wedge-shaped writing on a clay tablet, classroom teaching has been obsolete. It's been comical. Why don't we just write the assignments and algorithms on a clay tablet, hang it up on the wall, and let the students come who will teach themselves from our documents? Why, since the creation of writing with a pen on a piece of paper, do we still bother to have schools? Why, since the invention of movable metal type, don't we all just go to the library? Why do we have to have class? Why do we need teachers? Why, since the advent of the microchip, don't we all stay home in pajamas and hit send? <laughs> Technology is nipping at the heels of classroom teaching, but I perceive no threat. How could something false replace something true? How could a substitute, a proxy, step in for something real and alive? How could the virtual nudge out the actual? The other great threat to classroom teaching is the rush to data, to data, data-driven education. We must measure everything, percentages, charts, tables. I am not entirely opposed to this. If data-driven education were a pie graph, I would have a piece. <laughs> but I was not educated and did not become a classroom teacher to produce data. I love the classroom. I loved it as a student, and I love it as a teacher. I can name every teacher I ever had. Mrs. Mulshanuk, Miss Williams, Mrs. Parker, Miss Bogan, Mrs. Johnson, Mrs. Mize, Mrs. Parker, Mr. Eldridge, Miss Bush, and that's just through the sixth grade I could go on, I promise. I loved coming to class, the chairs, the windows, unzipping my book bag, and I loved my teachers. There was content, I suppose, but that's not what I remember. I remember my teachers. I remember being in the room, and no data and no bar graph will ever be assembled to replace that or even capture it. This week, my students worked on dividing a pizza between two people, and they realized that if you make a line down the center of the pizza, the two sides will be equal. After much trial and error, they came to this conclusion on their own, and I welcome you to try it. I think it's really going to take off and let this be where it begins. When they take a standardized test, they will be able to fill in the bubble next to the pizza that is cut directly in half. Do they know this will be the correct answer? Yes. But I don't care that much. What I care about is how they got there, how they figured it out for themselves. Standardized tests measure the arrival, but they have nothing to say about the journey. Do you know it? Do you not know it is second. And how do you know it? And who are you? is first. There, the only way this knowledge grows inside a student is with a teacher, a classroom teacher. Of course, my students will insist they did it themselves, and I don't try to disabuse them of that. There is not a bar graph for classroom teaching. There's no data for classroom teaching, and yet it persists this year, and the next year, and the year after that. 
Telling tens of thousands of people what to do is not teaching, it's shouting. And there's a lot of that going around. Showing somebody how to do something exactly the way you've always done it is not teaching, it's training. And there's plenty of that too. But the reality is that neither shouting nor training is classroom teaching. Nobody can touch it because nobody can point to it. You have it forever. When it grows inside you, it's doing its work. We teachers can disappear. We'll never see you again, probably. The chairs will be folded. It will be as if we were never here. There will be nothing after today. But not everything that counts can be counted. And not everything that matters can be put into a pie chart. Thank you.